My name is Ariel Jones and I am the development director at Mocha GA and welcome to tonight's artist talk. This event tonight is a part of Mocha GA's 2020-2021 Working Artist Project Fellowship and our winner during that cycle was of course Miss Kelly Taylor Mitchell. The Working Artist Project is an awards program that supports an established visual artist of merit who resides in the metropolitan Atlanta area. This initiative provides an unparalleled level of support for individual artists and expands the museum mission and promotes Atlanta as a city where artists can live, work, and thrive. The Working Artist Project program is generously supported by the Charles Lordans Foundation, the Antonori Foundation, the AEC Trust, with additional support from the National Endowment for the Arts. This year's round of Working Art Artist Project Fellows was selected by Marcella Guerrero, the Jennifer Rubio Associate Curator at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York. Um, and so now I'm going to talk a little bit about Kelly Taylor Mitchell. She is an artist and an art educator who lives and works in Atlanta, Georgia, Southwest Atlanta, which I'm also from. Sorry, I had to shout that out. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> she is currently an artist in residence with the Studio Artist Program at the Atlanta Contemporary and an assistant professor of art and visual culture and the art program director at Spelman College, yay HBCUs. She has participated in residence at Minnesota Center for Books, Book Arts, Anderson Ranch Art Center in Colorado and Women's Studio Workshop in Rosendale, New York. She earned a BFA from Tufts University and the School of, Mu of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston and an MFA from the Rhode Island School of Design. Kelly's multidisciplinary practice centers oral history and ancestral memory woven into the fabric of the Africana diaspora. Utilizing printmaking, papermaking, sculpture and textile, textiles, her work manifests as immersive installations, performative objects, and partnered artist book offerings, a venue for the sensorial to connect to, convey, and reimagine rituals and rites of autonomous kin, collectives, and individuals of the diaspora. Kelly is the current guest editor for Hand Paper Making Magazine's winter 2021 issue, Call and Respond, and has an upcoming solo exhibition, Preaching to the Choir, at Callenwald Fine Arts Center in Atlanta, Georgia, opening this March, 2022. Um, and we are about to present, I believe, a pre-recorded artist talk, which will be followed by a question and answer period. So please feel free to participate and write questions and comments in the chat box at any time. Um, Kelly is here with us and she will be happy to address them. And now without further ado, a video presentation from Kelly. Hi all, uh, this is Kelly Taylor Mitchell. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm of course an artist based in Atlanta and I'm very excited to share some of the work here in this Working Artist Project show titled Reunion. I wanted to start with the hand embroidered and beaded masks um, because for this show, this body of work really felt like um, the beginnings of things. These were the works that I've been making for the longest in this show. Um, and they really came about as a product of starting to understand these different connections and threads. I was observing as it related to ritual ceremony and ancestor worship throughout the diaspora, the African diaspora specifically. And it's important to clarify this, these threads, you know, aren't trying at all to suggest that this diaspora is a monolith, but I have been noticing through my own experiences, travel to Bahia and experiences with Candomblé and my own interest in speculative histories as it relates to the Great Dismal Swamp where my family um, has connections, that there are these relationships. And so I wanted to highlight them, emphasize them and sort of make my own space inside of them. And the masks felt like a way to do that. And so you see masking showing up in ritual ceremony and ritual practice as a form of self-protection as a way of covering one's face in order to embody an ancestor or uh, 
uh, connect to an Orisha or deity of some sort. So I started to make um, masks that first were referencing different textiles or um, sort of visual vocabularies that I was encountering in my time in Bahia in 2018. And then as I came back to my studio and I was starting to make connections between that space and the Great Dismal Swamp, which is a site of marinage or the practice of formerly enslaved peoples coming together and building community typically in partnership with indigenous folks and in this case in Virginia and North Carolina um, I wanted to make masks that spoke more to my experiences and sort of deifying um, things that were familiar to those spaces and so that's where you start to see numbers come into the work that are referential to sites in my life or history um, but a lot of the other patterning is really intuitive and organic and a big part of this masking practice for me beyond wearing them which I will share about um, is the act of making them, right? So the process being as valuable as the output. Um, reason being is I see these objects as functional, as utilitarian. Um, I had a wonderful conversation with artist Krista Franklin, um, and she really helped me see this work as a kind of spiritual technology. Um, and that has really stuck with me, right? I don't just see these pieces as art objects. They're living right now on um, braided coil bowls. I was newly introduced to clay this summer as a resident at the Women's Studio Workshop in um, Rosendale, New York. Um, but they're in this form because when they're not in a museum space, I take them off their bowls, I wear them. Um, and I would never suggest that someone else could wear them, right? I don't have the spiritual capacity or prowess to be making these sorts of conduits right or spiritual technologies for other people but I can do that for myself right and provide that outlet and space for ancestral connection and self-protection for myself through the act of making and sewing feels like such um, an ideal medium for that goal and it's present in every single uh, work in this show um, because it's a process that was passed down to me. My grandmother taught me how to sew, my mother taught me how to sew. And so if I'm trying to imbue um, these objects with sort of spiritual capacity, building intimacy between artists and objects feels really crucial. And so sewing is a way that I do that in a lot of these works. And when I wear these pieces, I'm wearing them in the context of private performance, ritual ceremony, I'm still trying to identify the right term to sort of describe what's happening in those spaces, but I do think that word private is crucial. Um, in the studio, I engage with these pieces with the totem works, which you're gonna see momentarily. Um, otherwise, I primarily wear them at the Great Dismal Swamp, right? So we're turning them to these charge sites where I have this ancestral connection um, for a ritual space for offering, for acknowledgement, for gratitude, for connection. Um, and in the site of the Great Dismal Swamp, when I do these performances, I document those experiences. And that documentation, those photographs, you see come up in the totem pieces, which, again, you'll see momentarily. And for now, I'll leave it there. So it made a lot of sense for me to talk to you about these works, which are untitled, but I often refer to them as the paper sequin pieces or the paper collar pieces after um, introducing you to those hand embroidered and beaded masks, because I talked about how those masks are really functional. They're utilitarian. I believe in what they can do on my behalf, right? They're tied to these histories of masking that we see in Candomblé, that we see in Yoruba and Igun Gun practices, that we see in the American South, in Louisiana, in Texas, and in Georgia. Um, but I wanted to make a work that referenced this history of masquerade, right? Of masking, of ritual ceremony, um, that didn't have that functional com component, right? It can still reference it, it can still talk about it, but it wasn't an object that I was gonna put on and utilize for my own um, practices of ancestor worship and connection and offering. So that's how I got to this idea of the paper sequence, right? How can I translate um, these things in a new form, right, that isn't as functional? So these paper pieces are all um, handmade paper. Each um, little circle is an individual piece of paper and the reason they have this relationship to the masks and I call them paper sequins is each 
collar or untitled work um, is sort of partnered with one of those hand embroidered and beaded masks, specifically as it relates to the color story. So as I was trying to decide um, what colors I wanted to use for each piece, I would reference one of those previous masks that we looked at to sort of guide me in my making and um, as it related to color. And so these are all handmade cotton. I'm making each piece individually. I'm using typically recycled mesh to sort of um, reference the facets that you see in individual sequins. And then in each uh, paper piece, you have a gold circular grommet in the center, sort of referencing that eyelet hole um, of an individual sequin that we have on those masks. And then we're populating them, putting them all together as a culmination. And again, sewing, so this practice, this repetition, um, another sort of ritual, right, um, of the sewing is how they get embedded onto a textile surface. Um, and each shape um, is sort of determined intuitively, but I was trying to reference the wearable. So that's where we get this term collars from that I keep saying paper collars, paper sequins. I wanted the shapes to be collar-like um, or sort of wearable-like, thinking about all of the sort of garments and pageantry um, and wearable um, accoutrements that are really present in these um, ritual ceremony spaces um, and practices that are coming from the masks. So next, I want to share with you sort of a series of works that I've been calling totems. So typically, when people think of totems, they think of an animal or a plant, right, serving as this um, spiritual symbol um, for a group of people or a group of kin or an individual. Um, but they are also, of course, sacred objects, right? Um, and that sort of definition is what led me to these to this title. Initially I'd been calling these works portals. Um, reason being these are the works, the totem pieces that I use in my studio for private performance, right? So when I don't have the opportunity to take those hand embroidered and beaded masks to the Great Dismal Swamp or to a charge site, um, I use them in relationship with these totem pieces. And so there is this space for a portal feeling appropriate because it felt like right something that gave me access to one of these charge sites without going there. Um, but then I started thinking more deeply about how I understand these works and how they're operating as objects. And they do feel incredibly sacred. They do feel representative of me and of other people. And so that's how I've started to lean more into this idea of the totem. So I also mentioned earlier that these totem works show images from the Great Dismal Swamp. So each totem piece has gel medium transfers, which is simply the process of printing out images, coating them with gel medium, and then sort of adhering them to the textile, and then removing right the white side or the back side of the paper to reveal only the image. And so that's how all of these images are adorned, and they're all images from the swamp during these performances. So in some pieces you'll see myself, and some pieces you'll just see nature and images of the swamp, um, but this idea of masking, right, and self-protection is happening again with the images themselves, too. Um, each piece is my body, so I lay down on this base textile, which is the same textile that's used um, as the base textile for those untitled paper sequin, paper collar pieces. They're also all dyed. Some of them are naturally dyed with onions or avocados. Some of them are synthetically dyed. Um, and I trace my form. And after my form has been traced, I sort of abstract it or expand it, and then I cut it and sew those edges with the hem that you're seeing here. And that practice was really informed by Howardina Pindell, who's a huge influence in my work. I, I really admire and value um, and benefit from her work. And this is something, this practice of inserting oneself into the work, using the body, is something that you see a lot in her paintings, right, where she lays down on the canvas, she cuts out her form and sort of sews herself back in to these like amorphous shaped um, non-stretched paintings. Um, each totem beyond showing my form, in this case this is actually me and my mom, um, so most of them are just me I think in here, yes, um, except for this one which is me and my mom. Um, so other family members are starting to come into um, the totem series as well which feels really important, right, because so much of this work beyond the um, relationship to the diaspora and these sort of threads as it relates to ancestor worship and ritual ceremony is also about 
family, right? Um, future ancestors, so people who are here right now, um, and I want them to be coming into the work as well. Um, so each totem piece is also adorned um, with different, typically um, <laughs> food-based items, but not always. So during my time in Bahia, um, I was really introduced to intimately this idea of um, food for ritual offering, um, and it's something that I've incorporated into my own altar practice at home, just leaving out a glass of water and food um, as a sort of invitation for ancestors um, to be welcome in that offering space, in that altar space rather. Um, and so that's why these objects are showing up um, in the totem series. In some cases we have peanuts, we have black eyed peas, we have popcorn, um, and we have pearls. And so I wanted to reference um, really particular experiences that were introduced to me in Bahia, which is why we're seeing popcorn, right? That was, that was the sort of encounter that I had um, with this ritual practice, which was being invited to um, go to a ritual ceremony in a very casual um, setting in someone's home. After I was just on a walk um, in the neighborhood, I was invited, and the popcorn was used as a... Um, cleansing tool, um, and the story was related to this uh, practice of Amalu, which is a Orisha in Condomble, and the story really mirrors the biblical story of Lazarus, but essentially, um, you know, the popcorn is used for healing, and when this Orisha was healed, like Lazarus, their sores, right, sort of disappear and are cleansed, but in this case, in this version, this iteration, those sores pop off of their face and turn into popcorn. So really tied to this idea of letting go, right, releasing things that don't serve you, and that was my first personal, intimate introduction to this idea um, of food-based ritual and ceremony and practice. And so I wanted to right, reference that through line, but I also wanted to, like the masks, understand where my story and my histories could come into these practices. And so that's why I started to sort of deify or sanctify um, food-based objects in my life that hold a lot of power and significance. And so I've been utilizing peanuts in my practice for a very long time. Um, so my family who has a history in the Great Dismal Swamp, that's my paternal side of the family, they're in North Carolina, the Carolina side of the swamp. Um, and our family still has our family farm, Mitchell Place. Um, and at Mitchell Place, they historically have grown peanuts. And so growing up, um, I would, in Pennsylvania, my grandfather would return from trips to North Carolina, or we would go to North Carolina together. And a big part of that journey was um, collecting and bringing back peanuts. And so they really hold a special um, space in our family lore, in our history, um, in our practices. Um, and so I wanted it to come into the work. Similarly, black eyed peas, I think a lot of people, especially southern folks, have a relationship with that material, right, as something that feels really sacred and ritual based as a, a New Year's meal um, for good luck. Um, and then, of course, pearls come into the work, especially as I think about my role at Spellman and um, the relationship between black women and pearls. And so that's another item and tool, not food based, but, um, and in this case, they're costume pearls, they are not <laughs> real pearls, um, that felt really relevant to include in something that has this sort of sacred capacity, but maybe in other contexts would not. Um, the pieces also um, give you a little introduction into me getting used to working with clay. So all of the totem pieces have ceramic beads that have all been handmade that are used to sort of stretch and sort of pull these pieces um, almost like an animal skin so that they can hang in space on top of a sort of dyed round of sand. And the reason I wanted to include this sand is I was really thinking about the practices of self-protection, right? That's a big theme through a lot of this work, this idea of self-protection. Um, and in this case, I'm referencing the practice of laying down brick dust um, in front of thresholds that you see throughout the American South, especially um, in South Carolina, Georgia, Louisiana, um, certain parts of Texas, um, to keep out spirits or people who cause you harm. So again, it's this another tool um, to sort of be in control a little bit where you can um, of your destiny and who has access to you. Um, but in this case, I sort of was inventing my own formula for the brick dust simply with sand and um, mica powder. 
So I'm very much <laughs> trained as a printmaker and as a pap paper maker. Um, and whenever I tend to make bodies of work, I usually partner an artist book with that body of work. It feels like a way for me to articulate or reiterate ideas or themes that maybe aren't um, incredibly legible throughout the work without um, this supplement or this component. And so behind me is an unbound book that I made um, at Women's Studio Workshop this summer along with those ceramic bowls and beads um, when I was an artist in residence there. Um, so again, it's all handmade paper, just like our paper collars and paper sequin works, um, made using deco boxes, um, among other practices. It's all cotton paper, except for the multicolor sheets um, have kudzu fire which was actually forged here in Atlanta in my backyard and I drove drove with lots of kudzu <laughs> to New York um, so that we could make um, kudzu blowouts on the sheets as well um, and the work is also really directly referencing some of the vocabulary that's coming up in the totem pieces so the circles the Adirondack star which is a um, reference to my grandmother's Adirondack star quilt pattern um, the teardrops, so these shapes that are showing up in other places in the work are also then coming into this book and then being hand embroidered with sequins. So again, trying to really um, immerse this unbound book in um, the sort of material language of the rest of the work to the best of my ability. Um, the piece also features screen printing um, as well as some letterpress printing using um, polymer plates and then of course it's all original text. So the work is called Between Starshine and Clay. It's a reference to Lucille Clifton's really seminal poem, Won't You Celebrate With Me? It's one of the lines. Um, in, in that poem, and it really felt appropriate for this work as a collection and as the book that sort of further articulates some of the ideas happening in the work, this idea of between starshine and clay, right? So much of my work is talking about ancestor worship and people who aren't here, um, but it's also incredibly present, right? It's in the past and in the future um, as much as it's in the now. So the, the title felt really appropriate, um, as does the poem at large, which I encourage you to read if it's unfamiliar to you. Um, and the Unbound book also lives um, in a clamshell box. So when it's not on view at Mocha GA, um, it is an addition of 15 books that live in a clamshell box and also are sort of partnered with um, the zine, which I made as sort of an exhibition um, component um, uh, for the show, which shares the statement for the exhibition as well. So I'm really excited about this piece. It's called Brown is My Favorite Color. It's a work in progress. Um, so I'm at the museum most Wednesdays, some Fridays, um, to work on this piece. Um, but I wanted to end with this work in progress because it sort of feels like we're at the end, but it's also very much a beginning. When I first started making this work, which was very recent, it's a very new piece, um, it really became clear to me that it feels like the origin story for a lot of the work in this room. So reason being, um, the journey of this work, of the ideas, the themes, the concepts that I'm interested in is my grandfather. Um, growing up, we were very close. He was really invested in family history. Um, he was really invested in the local history of where I grew up in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, which has um, a deep history as it relates to the Underground Railroad. Um, and he was also really invested um, in the history of the place of where he was from, Garysburg, North Carolina, um, which again is just down the road from the Great Dismal Swamp where his ancestors and my ancestors um, sought refuge. So when he passed away, my grandmother offered me banker's boxes full of his research, his interests, um, and of course I accepted. And upon going through this information, there was so much that I learned, right? Primarily that there was so much that he hadn't shared with me, which initially I felt a little hurt by, but then I came to understand that he really saw this, or this is my interpretation, that he really saw this information um, as sacred, um, as valuable, as meaningful, and it really should only be in the hands of people who um, want to find it, right? Who do that seeking um, and that discovery. And so in this history, that's when I learned about the family's connection to the Great Dismal Swamp, which I did not know um, until that point. And I learned that he was an avid photographer. 
I had no idea that um, I would be introduced to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds um, of gorgeous family slides, portraits, many of the images from family reunions that we would go to every summer as a kid. But um, he wasn't photographing when I was growing up. So all of the images from family reunions were from well before my time, the 70s, the 60s, etc. And lots of images of my dad and my uncle, of course, um, in these images, which was really special to see. And so I wanted to sort of create a document that really um, shared this history, but also, again, protected it. So you're going to see that there's a lot of, again, sewing um, happening in this work. So all of these images are heat transfers of some of his images. And then I'm coming in once a week and sort of offering these protective gestures in the form of the sewing to sort of cover the images as well. And then in the central area, we have um, Mitchell Place. So this is the homestead at Mitchell Place in Garysburg, North Carolina. But the reason all of these images are existing in this format on these tablecloths is I really wanted to think more deeply about the oral histories that are working in my practice that I mine from, that I pull from, that I reference um, so much in my work. And, you know, I'm very aware of this history of the banker's boxes and getting the research from my grandmother in the form of paperwork and documents and images as a type of orality. But I wanted to understand, well, what are the scenarios in which um, oral histories truly were oral, right? They were spoken to me. And so I immediately thought about Christmas and Easter and birthdays at my grandparents' house in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Um, and when these occasions would happen, we would sit around my grandmother's dining room table um, and she would put out, without fail, every occasion, a tablecloth that looked just like this, a Battenberg-style tablecloth. And depending on the occasion, I'm sure this is resonating for a lot of people listening, depending on the occasion, right, if it's Christmas, she has a red tablecloth underneath the Battenberg because the red, you know, pops through um, the embroidered cutouts. And so that's how I chose this sort of matrix for these stories, this very nonlinear story to sit on top of. And I also wanted to think about this idea of revisionist history. I was recently introduced to the history of the Battle of Atlanta Cyclorama, um, which lives here in Atlanta at the Atlanta History Center. And I had no idea about the history of the cyclorama. I was familiar with cycloramas, right, as the sort of uh, tools for conveying really important information before we had movie theaters. Um, it was a way for people to go and see history, right, usually in this huge cyclical form that was immersive. Um, and specifically, this um, document shares the Battle of Atlanta, which is the turning point in the Civil War. It's why the Union wins and the Confederacy falls in the most simplistic form. And after this document was created, um, it would travel, right? Um, just as you know, uh, carnivals or medicine shows would travel. Um, the cyclorama would travel to different towns and cities, but as you can imagine, especially in the South, a lot of people were not excited <laughs> to see this history um, reintroduced to them. Um, so people would come, they would see this document, and they would revise it. They would go back home, they would grab their <laughs> paint and paintbrushes come back and they would paint on top of the document and change the history. And so eventually um, the cyclorama was so revised that it no longer was depicting um, the fall of the South but instead um, was depicting what we understand now is this idea of the lost cause ideology, right? This sort of thing that we see in so much content, um, especially things like Gone with the Wind is a really um, sort of pointed reference that helps people understand that idea um, and that we see a lot of white supremacist reference this lost cause ideology of what could have been or what should have been or maybe what really even was as it relates to the South and their causes. Um, and of course Maynard Jackson, who's the first black mayor of Atlanta, um, made a big project of sort of resurrecting um, the cyclorama from um, its revised state, um, purchasing it, putting it at the Atlanta History Center and having it restored, right? So it doesn't have um, that ulterior history being shared. But of course, right, that 
um, that legacy, that relationship of this document, of the changes it went through, is still present, um, even if just uh, spiritually or metaphorically. And so I had been doing a lot of reading, because I was totally fascinated by everything about this, but then I became most struck by a lot of the first-hand journalistic accounts of people witnessing other people viewing the cyclorama for the first time. Um, even it's in its restored state, right? So going to see it because it serves as this almost monument to this lost cause ideology. And that fascinated me. Even though it's restored, still going to see it for that reason. And upon seeing it, falling to their knees and crying because this document felt so affirming to their identity, to how they understand themselves, to the truths or lies that they tell themselves. Um, and so that made me reflect, right? Well, what sort of historical um, document would make me fall on my knees and cry because it felt so affirming of a thing that I just need to be true, right? Even if it's not. Um, and so it may feel strange for <laughs> a monument in certain cases to white supremacy to sort of be an inspiration for an origin story or a nonlinear history as it relates to my family and our stories and orality. Um, but for me, it makes a lot of sense, right? How can I articulate um, a version of history that I want to tell, right? I think so often in my practice, I'm familiar with people wanting trauma or death or violence or um, histories of enslavement to be really forward and present. Um, and for some time I did that and it got me here, so I'm grateful, but um, it didn't always feel good um, for many reasons that I won't over-articulate now, but I wanted to figure out ways how can I um, talk about these histories, talk about these stories, and share the versions, even the speculative versions, right? Things that I imagine, things that have kernels of truth, but also are totally rooted in um, a reality that I build for myself. And so that is a big part of this project. And I really look to people like Octavia Butler, um, sort of the mother of speculative fiction and histories, um, when thinking about this idea of nonlinear stories or sort of creating my own truth or reality um, out of what was given to me, right, which is that history from my grandfather. Um, so I'm really excited about this piece. Um, I don't know how long it will be in progress. I don't know if it will be indefinite. I don't know if it will feel finished, um, closer to finished at the end of uh, the show in January. I doubt it. Um, you'll have the chance to see this again. This piece is gonna be in my show at Cowanwald Fine Arts Center in March, where I expect to also be continuing work on it, more adornments, more plant life um, from the swamp, more images, more sequins, more everything. I, kind of tend to be a maximalist in some regards in my work. Um, but in all cases, with the totems, with the paper sequins, with the collars, with the masks, and of course with this piece, um, I think what I feel most excited about in this show is I see, see so much room for what is next, right? Um, and I'm incredibly excited to, to keep making and to be doing more. Thank you. I felt so privileged, I didn't, you know, Visually, I could not understand or kind of perceive the depth and intentionality. I know that you as an artist, are, you're very intentional, but it was wonderful to kind of experience that through your artist talk. Um, I was going, some, some of our participants have already um, posted questions. Um, I wanted to ask, um, can I just go through the chat and look at the questions and perhaps pose them to you? Would that be easiest? That sounds great. Okay, and I welcome you all to comment in the chat if you have questions and we will make sure they're read and hopefully we have time and Kelly can answer them. Um, so we have a question from Nadia Blass. She said, Kelly, can you talk more about the stitches as a form of protection and about protection in this work in general? Sure, thank you for the question, Nidia. So um, I really am interested in sewing as a protective gesture in the same way that I think about sewing as a way to, be, uh, to build intimacy between artist and object. And I think a reason that I'm able to sort of ascribe this power to that gesture of sewing is again, because of how that um, way of working was taught to me, right? It isn't something that I learned in school um, or in my BFA or MFA programs. It's something that 
my grandma taught me while sitting on her couch and watching as the world turns. And so that's a really, you know, specific, um, particular um, memory and insight um, that's incredibly valuable to me. And also uh, my mother played a role in sort of my sewing education. And then that's not to say that I'm any sort of um, sewing expert, right? But that imperfection and sort of homespun um, origin of that knowledge for me is really valuable in sort of imparting these pieces either with power or in the case of the cyclorama and the images protecting them. And so media, especially as a photographer, um, I know that you understand and sort of the, I don't know, different concerns that can rest around sharing the images of others, right? And sort of this idea of consent. And so like, how do we present other people, their stories, um, a moment of vulnerability perhaps, um, but also respect that. And so giving them some literal coverage, right? Um, by covering the image with the sewing, but that sewing having that um, sort of material history for me feels really important. So I hope that addresses your question. Okay. Um, we have a question from Molly Mitchell who asks, for not artists, please explain a clamshell box and a zine. Sure. And then she has a follow-up question, um, which I'll allow I'll ask after um, okay. <laughs> okay. So the clam box is referring to the Unbound Artist book that I shared with y'all called Between Starshine and Clay. So in the show, you see this Unbound book framed, um, but outside of the show, it's an addition, meaning there's 15 copies of this Unbound book. And instead of living in frames, it lives in a clamshell box, um, which is a type of hard shell box um, that you can open and close. And it's sort of made just right. So it fits the, the individual sheets of paper. So they're not shifting around when it lives inside this box. And on one side of the box, when you open it, are the loose sheets of the book. And on the other side, there's a little pocket. And inside of that pocket lives a zine. And if you aren't, if you are not familiar, zines are just sort of like low production, meaning there's usually not a lot of them, um, or they're made very simply. Books, small books in this case, and in my zine, um, I share images of myself in the Great Dismal Swamp, the ones that are also um, coming up in the totem pieces. And I also share the text for the exhibition statement for the show um, in that zine as well. Um, and Molly Mitchell also said, if you have access this evening, would it be possible for you to share the text um, Oh. or have an electronic copy of the zine that you could possibly share with everyone that would be preferable. Well, is she talking about the text for the book? Because the text for the zine is just the exhibition statement. Um, so the text for the book, I can read to you um, right now. It's a, it's a short book. <laughs> it's just- Yeah, it's she says specifically the text for the book. Right. And the, the zine is also um, on our website. We have a link on the exhibition page. Awesome. Thank you, Stacey. Um, so the text for the book titled Bes Between Starshine and Clay um, is as follows. Bear with me. I'm, it's on my phone. Um, okay, here we go. Do you remember me? You look like a sun-soaked porch, lemonade in an oak barrel, playing cards that stick. Follow the dirt road until you reach the middle of nowhere, the center of everything. Accept their blessing, offer your gratitude. Wear white on Friday and dance in the circle. We have met before. Endless sky, bare feet, southern heat. Hold my hand, do you remember me? And that is Between Starshine and Clay. And I can also pop a link to Lucille Clifton's poem, um, Won't You Celebrate With Me? Um, because the, um, the book, the book's title, Between Starshine and Clay, is borrowed from a line in Lucille's poem. So if you haven't read it, I recommend it, and it now is in the chat for you. Okay, thank you so much. So we have quite a lengthy question from Jackson Markovic. Great. He says, I'm most curious about your question, what historical document would bring me to my knees would be the most affirming? I think about the history of Stonewall, this myth of the first brick. I recently mm. learned it was a shoe or a bottle. Mm. 
Mm. I'm curious about the role of the artist in creating these documents that bring ourselves or others to our needs, creating the historical document that does not, that has yet to exist. I guess my question is, what specific historical document do you feel affirms you the most? Hmm. It's a really thoughtful question. Thank you. Um, and a really wonderful reference thinking about Stonewall as well. Um, and I think the point is, as you said, there isn't a historical document that um, offers me that um, reaction or response yet. Um, and so I don't know if it is the role of the artist to do it, but it's the role of this artist um, to try to to try to create it. So that's how I'm thinking about that piece titled Brown is My Favorite Color, the last work that we um, looked at in the video, trying to allow this document to be that thing. Um, and I really see this, that piece is ongoing. I, I think I talked about in the video that I don't know how long it will be in progress. And I really don't have a finite date. Oh, by April, whatever, it will be done. I'm, I'm really not interested in that. I think it's such a, for me, monumental task to create a document that would elicit such a reaction since I've never had that experience. And I don't entirely know what that looks like. Um, so, so I'm trying to, to build that. So I hope I'm addressing your question a little bit, but I think it's important just to reiterate that I'm, it sounds like, um, the general sort of impetus for wanting to create this document, um, resonates with you. And I, I just really appreciate the thoughtfulness of the question. So thank you. Um, so we have a question. Can you talk about the origin of the title? Brown is my favorite color. Absolutely. Um, as many things in my work, um, that title is coming from my papa, my grandfather, um, whose images you see in that piece. Um, my grandfather was a man of few words, um, even though he had lots of personality and a lot to share and a lot of knowledge. Um, but something that he would say growing up often was that brown was his favorite color. Um, and, you know, I would always be so disturbed. Papa, brown, brown, no, 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 Papa, no, you have to pick a different color. It can't be brown. He's like, brown's my favorite color. Um, and I never understood the depth to that choice. Um, I didn't, of course, being eight, nine, ten, or however old I was, um, consider that there was any sort of profound meaning <laughs> um, behind um, his choice of favorite color. Um, but I think back now, um, upon reflection, one, I genuinely think that brown is his favorite color. <laughs> and two, um, I really think part of that love of brown was um, a love of self and a love of his people. Um, and he wanted to impart that in all the ways <laughs> that he could. Um, to his grandchildren, even in these sort of subtle ways. And I think that also, I think many of us can attest to the power of language, right? In these sort of subliminal ways and these messages that we hear and how impactful they are. And so I think it was just a very subtle um, um, way to convey a practice of self-love. Well, all right then. Um, thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you for um, spending the time making this cherished work and then also um, talking to us about it and welcoming us into your thought processes and your practice. It's been a pleasure.